Hi, everyone. Uh, someone asked me today the question I'm going to show you on the next panel, uh, which has prompted me to come out with a JWO mission statement that we've had online for probably 10, 15 years, too. Uh, and anyway, uh, with mod modest modifications or updates. This is what I received uh, eight hours ago, or approximately eight hours ago. Uh, work 1963 writes me, I'm not sure if your point is to help spread God's word or to tear it down. So I thought to myself, if he has any doubt, let me give him the, the what has been on our website, jesuswordsonly.org, since forever, since the site was first begun, which I have a vague recollection. It was in 2009 or in that r realm. Okay, so this is what you see when you land at the homepage of jesuswordsonly.org. And we will begin reading. Our mission is to proclaim our Lord Jesus' lesson that he was the, quote, sole teacher, Matthew 23, 8 to 11, and sole pastor, John 10, verse 16. The word is poem in there. He sternly told the apostles they were not to call themselves or anyone else a teacher. In John, Jesus explained why when he insisted that the, quote, apostolos is not more important than the one who sent him, John 13, 16. The Greek word apostolos means either the title of apostle or messenger or one that is sent. Here, Jesus meant he was more important than any apostle or messenger. Even John the Baptist realized that despite knowing he himself was the greatest of prophet who ever lived prior to Jesus, Matthew 11, verse 11, yet, the, yet he, John the Baptist, must decrease so that unfettered acceptance of Jesus' message would increase, John 3, verse 30 to 31. Once Jesus began preaching the kingdom, then it would rob him of the authority God gave Jesus to treat anyone else's words, particularly from mere correspondence whose author does not claim to quote Jesus or God as an authority on the same level as Jesus. Here's the quote. All authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. That's in Matthew 28, verse 18. For more on this principle, see our articles, the Jesus Wars Only Principle, explained from Numbers chapter 12 and Deuteronomy 18. Next heading, Competing Love for Paul and Pauline Doctrine. The modern church has instead fallen in love with Paul, or more correctly, the points in Paul's writings that soften the requirement of costly grace, which Jesus taught. This causes a vying for control over the church. Either Paul and his dispensation of grace applies, or Jesus and his costly grace gospel applies, as Bonhoeffer highlighted. We have developed two masters. Mainstream Christian theologians largely defend, dismissing Jesus' words as applicable only to a prior dispensation of law. Sometimes this is called dispensationalist or covenant theology, but it all ends up the same, marginalizing Jesus' words. The famous theologian Rudolf Boltman even claimed Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians 5 or 16 that it is necessary to treat Paul's teachings pre-resurrection as irrelevant. Now, I'm going to actually do a digression, so usually I just put a link and then I'll tell you to go there in this article as I read it. But this is one time I'm going to make the exception as we go down this list. We're going to le read the article that's there and we're going to only read a portion of it to make it go faster. Synopsis of Boltman's thesis that marginalizes Jesus's words to 12 apostles prior to Paul. So in, us, in other words, Boltman's going to say it's irrelevant to care or even to discuss anything Jesus spoke, spoke before the cross. So when the cross came, everything changes. That's Boltman's view. This is a German uh, theologian and, and professor at schools uh, just before Nazi Germany, and he stayed in Germany through the entire Reich, and he never complained about it. That's another problem I have with this man. Anyway, Boltman admitted the lack of importance to Paul of Jesus' teachings when Jesus was in the flesh. That is, Paul did not consider important the teachings gave the Twelve, which are recorded in the Gospels. For Paul never quotes Jesus except the liturgy, which is taken from Luke's Gospel anyway. This, these are Boltman's points. And so we need to follow the, the example of Paul. He didn't care what the 12 had to say. They imparted nothing to me. And he's making this, Boltman is a virtue, that he didn't get anything from the 12, and he got it all from his ascended Jesus. So that was a different, the crucifixion that happened, that's what's different between the 12 and the Jesus of Paul. So the Jesus of Paul is the crucified Christ. The Jesus of the 12 is the uncrucified Christ. And that's the inferior Christ. And the superior Christ is the, one that it was crucified. So there's a little bit of that going on, as you'll see. In fact, that's not only a little bit, it's exactly what Boltman reads into Paul's remark in Corinthians, as we'll see. However, Boltman claims this was deliberate and perfectly explains Paul's meaning in 2 Corinthians 5, 16. 
Bowman says we must obey this passage from Paul, which tells us to reject any further obedience or adherence to Jesus' words while, quote, in the flesh, i.e. the period when Jesus taught the 12 apostles prior to Jesus' ascension. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.16 that, quote, even though we once knew Christ by means of the flesh, kata sarka, we know him thus no longer. Bowman interprets this to mean that Paul tells us that we once knew Jesus by means of doctrines delivered when in the flesh, when Jesus was in the flesh to the 12, but now we know Jesus through messages delivered to Paul when Jesus was in his resurrected spiritual body. We could also just add there in the in the post-crucified body. See, that could fit in with covenant theology, which well, ties everything to the crucifixion. Everything changes. So what happens? We now have Paul's dictum in 2 Corinthians 5.16, even though we once knew Christ by means of the flesh, think of the four Gospels is what he's really saying. We know him, Jesus, thus no longer. We no longer want to know anything about what those four Gospels said. We only want to know what Jesus, a descended Jesus, is saying to Paul. Boatman ignores thereby that the same resurrected Jesus told the apostles to remember to teach everything he had previously, quote, commanded them, Matthew 20, 20. How could this command entirely change if Jesus was taken up into heaven? Ironically, Bowman gives Paul's Jesus this unique authority over the pre-ascended Jesus, even though Paul never even quotes the ascended Jesus to support any teachings of Paul. How can Bowman justify that Paul met a Jesus who had no flesh and then could use Paul's words to exclude any attention of the Jesus who taught the Twelve? First, Boatman's application of 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16 assumes Paul encountered a voice and light version of Jesus without flesh on the road to Damascus, Acts 9, verses 7 to 11. This is not clear that Jesus no longer had human flesh after sending. Luke's accounts do not say this is a crucial gap in Boatman's reasoning. Another problem is that Paul's only quote of the ascended Jesus in Paul's epistles is in 2 Corinthians 12 verses 8 to 9. Yet this is so highly problematical of a quote of a quote that no one can believe the true Jesus actually uttered it. It contains a denial by the Lord to release Paul from the dominion of an angel of Satan. For this Lord says he showed enough grace to Paul already. Most scholars agree our Lord Jesus could not have refused to release Paul from a dominion of Satan in Paul's flesh. They excuse this passage as somehow being garbled and should be ignored. Here is a summary of that account. Paul asked his Jesus that the scolops, a sharp prod in his flesh, which Paul says came from an angel of Satan, to be removed. In response, the Lord, presumably Jesus, told Paul, no, explaining, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 9. Next, in light of that failure, Bowman's thesis, to have any legs, has to show us a verse that truly potentially qualifies as from the true Jesus being quoted by Paul. The only other event that Paul records that constitutes a post-ascended statement by Jesus is in Acts 22, verse 17. Here in Acts, Paul testifies about an encounter with Jesus in a trance while Paul was praying at the Jerusalem at the Jerusalem temple, in which that Damascus road, Jesus told Paul not to go see the 12 apostles for the first time. At that point, the 12 apostles were just 25 yards away as it was their daily practice to meet at the temple's portico. In this quote, Paul's Jesus explained to Paul that the disciples, the apostles in context, would not believe Paul had met the true Jesus. Rather than appear to the twelve and all disciples meeting on the portico to convince them, Paul's Jesus urged Paul to flee Jerusalem immediately and go to the Gentiles. See our article, our articles, Paul's trance and who did Paul meet outside Damascus. Who can believe the true Jesus could appear in the wilderness to Paul, a blasphemer by his own admission, but could not take up a couple of minutes to appear to the 12, just 25 yards away from the spot Paul had this Jesus appear in a trance. And let me show you the verse I'm talking about. <clears throat> it acts, it's Acts 22, verse 17 to 18, King James Version. To me, this is the most anomalous, meaning out of, uh, doesn't make sense that this is the real Jesus, our Jesus, the Jesus of, of the 12. And it came to pass, so he's, he's uh, Paul's testifying in front of a group of people at the temple, uh, mobs angry and he's asked permission to explain to the mob what, what you know I, yes my my friend uh, violated the temple's inner sanctum that's a uh, you know but I was in a ceremony about that's his excuse earlier first but then he's telling his life story and then he says after the Damascus Road experience he made a beeline after that and he walked or or traveled all the way to Jerusalem to see the apostles. And in context, when you read this whole passage, he wants to repent to them. But his Jesus tells him, don't do that. 
don't go see them. Okay, so I'm just, but I'm going to give you the, uh, the actual words his Jesus says that he can't convince the 12 uh, uh, that he really met Jesus. Listen to this. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. That's an ecstasy. That's the, the way demons speak, like the Python priestess of Philippi and Delphi. So that's a very strange thing, an ecstasy in Greek. So Acts 22, verse 18. And saw him, that means I saw Jesus saying unto me, so he's talking about the Damascus Road Jesus, and now this is transitioning. He says, make haste. His Jesus says, make haste. Hurry, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they, the apostles, will not receive thy testimony concerning me. That's who he wants to repent. And then he goes on in the next sentence is, but I wanted to tell the apostles I was sorry for killing Steve, uh, Stephen and all these others. And, and then his Jesus says, no, you, you're going to go out to the uh, to evangelize, all right? So this doesn't make sense. Our Jesus could have just simply, if he could materialize on the road to Damascus and appear in a physical form, why can't he materialize again, walk 25 yards in front of Paul, no harm will come to him, and it, because everyone will see it's Jesus introducing him, and this good has settled everything. But his Jesus says, he, he he's implying clearly, I can't convince them. I, I, I'm Jesus, supposedly. I can appear physically to you in the middle of the desert wilderness, but I can't show up here at the temple and walk, walk 25 yards with you. I mean, all of that is clearly implied here when you read the context. So this, to me is the most one of the most extraordinary proofs that Paul's Jesus cannot be the true Jesus. All right, so let's look again at Boltman's qu quotation. He's going to rely upon this quote of Paul's to create a dispensational theory behind why you don't have to listen to Jesus who was in the flesh. Now you only listen to the spiritual Jesus of Paul and from Paul's own statements. 2 Corinthians 5.16, that, quote, even though we once knew Christ by means of the flesh, some person who appeared to have human flesh but didn't actually have it, according to Philippians 2.7, right? We know him thus no longer. So we know no, we know Jesus no longer by the, the person who spoke through the, the, body, the thing that looked like a body. We only know him the way Paul knows him, which is in the second heaven. And in 2 Corinthians, the same book, Seven chapters later, from this statement, Paul says, I get all my revelations from the third heaven, but yet I cannot repeat any of them to you. It's illicit. He uses the word unlawful. It's unlawful for me to tell you what I've heard, and it's also incomprehensible what it's saying anyway. So, But he somehow is able to interpret it spiritually. That's what he's trying to tell you. Now let's can pick up where we left off from before. Okay, let's, let's continue. And I want to back up and just remind you that Boltman is the fourth, considered the fourth greatest leading theologian of the 20th century. And uh, that means this man's doctrines were translated into English, put into theological seminaries throughout the United States and throughout the world. That's the why he's one of the fourth, one of the four great theologians of the 20th century. So this man has had huge impact on what your pastors think because he's teaching them via this network that takes his uh, his words as authoritative explanation of Paul's meaning and who has emphasis and who doesn't in the new currently as teaching in the church. So let's continue again. Boltman necessarily must be implying that everything Paul wrote in his letters are as if Jesus was writing constantly to Paul, even though Paul never says this is the case. So Paul writes endlessly with no quotations of Jesus. He sometimes it says the Lord told me this, but he doesn't quote him verbatim. And then it, you don't know if it's an interpretation or it's a quote, but they're very free, infrequent. There's just about three or four times he does that, but generally he does not explain. And many times he says, I don't know if this is from the Lord or it's not, it's me speaking, not the Lord. He says those kind of things, but he doesn't signal you when he should, and to be biblically acceptable under Jeremiah 35's uh, uh, lesson to the Rechabites, we've talked about that elsewhere. So you have to quote your source. And, and you know, and now Jesus, again, what the Father is, di he's different because the Father speaks over him, says, listen to him, giving the confirmation in front of multiple witnesses that the God, God is saying that Jesus is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18. Different issue. But Paul doesn't know about the prophet prophecy that 
Acts 3, 21, 23, Peter says, as Jesus is the prophet, if you don't obey his words, you will be cut off from God's people. Paul is thinking that you can have a completely ascended Jesus talking to him all the time, but you can't repeat anything he says. It's illicit, and you can't remember any of it verbatim because it's in it's uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, unsearchable, un, uh, incomprehensible. <laughs> That's what he says in 2 Corinthians 12, 3 to 6. Take a look at that. Let's continue. And that Paul was telling us, this Boltman's in saying, impliedly in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, to only listen to the Jesus revealed, quote, in me, meaning Paul, even though no attribution is given by Paul to Jesus for what Paul is writing, except 2 Corinthians 12, 7. That's the only verse where he actually quotes his Lord, presumably Jesus, refusing to give him a release from an angel of Satan who is tormenting him in his flesh and and uh, his Jesus says, no, nope. and, and he said, I, he prayed three times to his Jesus to, to let him be released, and his Jesus refused to release him from a, a torment of an angel of Satan, okay? Demonic control, if you don't know what these words mean. And, and, and Paul interpreted it as Jesus wanted him to be humble now, and all I have to say is, First of all, why would our Jesus not release someone from an, a torment of an angel of Satan that is tor tormenting and controlling him? And second of all, why would the demons collaborate with some Jesus to make Paul humble? Because that they would do the opposite, make him boast more. And if you just look at the prior chapter to this, 2 Corinthians 11, it's boast from verse 1 all the way to the bottom, where the, it ends with him saying, I've suffered more than anyone else. And I just have to say, Paul, you know what? You hadn't even died yet, okay? You killed people. You force people to commit blasphemy. They're going to hell because of you. You should be complicit in this, that. You made them blaspheme Yahweh. You, you're, uh, ah. But anyway, the point is, he didn't suffer as bad as the people he had already killed and persecuted previously. So that's just a fact of life. And yet he's boasting endlessly from the beginning of verse 1 of chapter 11 to the end. Let's continue. Again, that passage Second Corinthians twelve seven is where Paul's Jesus leaves Paul subject to control and influence of a demon, an angel of Satan. Bullman ignores that fact, the passage that is so embarrassing to Paul fans that they reject this passage nowadays as authentic. That is how deep is the chagrin of Paul-leaning scholars about the only unique quote of Jesus by Paul in all of his epistles. The modern Paul defenders claim this passage could not be how Paul intended it to read, meaning the Second Corinthians 12 passage of the demonic torment of an angel of Satan. Thus, based on such a reading of 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, Boltman exalts Paul's words as if 100% inspired and from the ascended Jesus, although never actually quoting the ascended Jesus in support. We are supposed to treat the words exclusively from Paul as superior to the pre-ascended Jesus, meaning the, the one known to the twelve face to face, by some presumed constant inspiration of Paul in every word. And again, Paul discounts that he has constant inspiration. He, con he, he very frequently says, I think this is from the Lord. I think this is from the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm not speaking for the Lord. Here I'm speaking for the Lord. See, but he doesn't quote. See, that's the problem in that you're supposed to do that. And this is the, continuing. And this is thus supposedly why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, that we are no longer to know Jesus from the time Jesus taught while in the flesh, meaning the time of the 12 apostles. So that, by the way, this is another verse that discounts the validity and importance of listening to the 12 apostles, which we already saw in Second Corinthians, Second, you'll see in Galatians chapter two, it didn't matter to me what these men were, the, the 12, uh, and, and he talked about them in the past tense. It's something they were in the past. I'm getting my revelations from a superior source, in fact, which is Jesus in this third heaven, which he explains it's the third heaven in the book. Of Corinthians, Second Corinthians, twelve, beginning begin, beginning at verse one, but you have to read all the way to seven to see that. And this is that, and this is the supposedly why Paul says in Second Corinthians five sixteen, we are no longer to know Jesus from the time Jesus taught while in the flesh. However, the one epistle that attributes words to Paul's ascended Jesus, Second Corinthians twelve, Boltman ignores, leaving later Paul's supporters to likewise ignore this, or they reject this passage, meaning the one about being under demonic control, as truly from Jesus, as this Jesus expressly left Paul under demonic influence, re refusing Paul's repeated prayers three times actually for release from an angel of Satan. You have to go look at reverse. Mount C reverse interlinear at BibleGateway.com, and you'll see it says angel of Satan, and then the word is torment, and he get, he's the only one he'll tell you. Others will say, buffet my body. No, no, it, the word is torment. We clearly have a problem. The words of the ascended Jesus quoted by Paul are rejected or ignored by all modern Christianity. 
But the words of Paul that never quote the ascended Jesus, except once, are given a priority over the pre-ascended Jesus. We surely are in a mess listening to Paul. As Moses made clear, prophets who do not quote God or the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, verses 15, 19, who God speaks over and tells us to listen to him, i.e. Jesus at his transfiguration, are to be ignored. You have to quote. Other than the prophet and Moses is listening face to face and he's just relaying what he's heard. And that means he's a witness direct and direct. But if you want to say a vision or a dream and you have to quote God Yahweh, and that's a mandatory thing. And that's what was proven in the book of Jeremiah chapter 35 with the Rechabites, which refused to listen to Jeremiah, giving him, God had set it all up with him. I want you to give a command. And the command as required by Moses said, just tell him, I, Jeremiah, tell you, don't dr- dr- don't drink wine. And this violated the Rechabites' uh, patriarch, and they refused. And then God said, fantastic, that's what I wish my people Israel did. If my word isn't attached to the quote of that prophet, he doesn't say, I said it, you don't obey it. And the Rechabites, would, God promised, will always have a representative sitting at his throne through, through eternity for that honorable act of refusing the prophet Jeremiah's instruction to eat, to drink wine, because they knew that it didn't have the command uh, of saying Yahweh said. That's why he was just, they were justified in not accepting someone who's speaking by, and he says, other than my servant Moses, God said, I speak by visions and dreams to all other prophets. Now that doesn't include the prophet like Moses, which is the prophecy of Deuteronomy 18, the prophet, and we've talked about who, why Jesus is the prophet based on Acts 3, verse 21 to 23. Now let's go on. Boatman concedes Jesus pre-crossed is irrelevant to Paul. William Reed, in, uh, born in 1859, died in 1906 in his book, Paul, 1904, now he's German, had argued Paul's writings show little knowledge of the teachings of Jesus reflected in the Gospels. This statement of his, which is just he's stating it as fact, he was not n- trying to be negative to Paul, he's just saying there's no... Uh, quotations of Jesus in the epistles of Paul. And so he's a scholar and he's saying just the fact of life. This led to the back from Paul to Jesus movement in Germany, which is now largely forgotten due to Boltman's influential reply. This is in Andreas J. Kostenberger, L. Scott Kellum. The book is entitled The Cradle, the Cross, and the Crown, an introduction to the New Testament, B&H Publishing, 2009 at 370. And when that's highlighted like that, you can go there and, and see the book itself and read it yourself. Rudolf Bultmann, a famous theologian, conceded the point of Reed's in Bultmann's Significance of the Historical Jesus for the Theology of Paul, 1929. Also republished in Faith and Understanding, this is English, see how this is translated? Uh, this is why Bultmann has so much influence. New York, Harper and Row, 1969, Volume 1 at 220. However, Boltman turned it around as a proof that we should only be following Paul because of Paul's directions in 2 Corinthians 5.16. So, by the way, do you see the circularity, my friends? Is Paul is able to establish his own validity, as superior to Jesus, just by his own words, instead of somebody else confirming it or saying this. And you can't use canon committees from 393 to decide things. And just to be sh- sure, we all know this. Uh, I'm going to put it into a video, but I've done it before, and we have an article. Metzger says clearly the early church regarded only the words of Jesus in the Gospels as authoritative, inspired works. All the writings, all the letters, all of that, including Paul's epistles, were not regarded as inspired by the early church up through 180 AD. They might speak with wisdom, but that's not the same as having the inspired word of God and nothing on par with Jesus, who the apostles had seen Jesus face to face. If you know Numbers 12, face-to-face is superior to anybody claiming to have talked to Jesus in a vision or dream, even if it was real, (laughs) God has said in Numbers chapter 12. Boltman thus starts by admitting that Jesus' teachings pre-resurrection were indeed irrelevant to Paul. Boltman says this, It is most obvious that Paul does not appeal to the words of the Lord Jesus in support of his views. Bowman continues, when the essential, essentially Pauline conceptions are considered, it is clear that Paul is not dependent on Jesus. Jesus' teachings is, to all intents and purpose, irrelevant for Paul. That's at page 223. And that he's, he's not saying that's a, a defect in Paul. That's why he's so much more important than Jesus of the earth, because he's the been t- talk, talking to Jesus after Jesus ascended, and therefore that means this Jesus he's talking to is even more authoritative than the one that was on earth with Paul. 
See, this is the logic. You have to understand your pastors, your covenant theologians, your dispensationalists, they're all suffering from this horrible, horrible apostasy where somebody can come later and contradict the Jesus of earth. And that person would be allowed to negate Jesus when the reverse is how you apply apostasy. You always look at what came uh, last as having to be tested what came before. But this time we're going to test with the validity of Jesus' words by something that comes later, and that's exactly the opposite. And don't forget, you have Matthew 24 that says, uh, Jesus, the first warning, he says, there are going to be others who say, I'm Jesus, I'm the Messiah. They're going to meet you, in a, they're going to meet somebody in a wilderness road like Damascus, or they're going to uh, go to a private room like Paul claims Jesus, his Jesus met him in a private room in Acts 23, verse 11. These two situations, Jesus even just provided as an example, and Paul satisfies each of the two examples. But Jesus makes clear, when I return, it's going to be a universal event. Every eye will see me. And therefore, he says, don't listen to anybody who ever says they met me in these two types of situations, as well as any situation that is not a universal event. So we know that Paul's Jesus cannot be the real Jesus anyway. But, that, but I'm just digressing here a little bit. But you see, this is where you are left in the end. You must just get rid of the Jesus of earth and only pay attention to the Jesus of the, the alleged Jesus of Paul, who's the ascended. This is post-ascension Jesus. As others summarize Boltman's initial point, they state, Boltman noted that Paul rarely alluded to or quoted from the teachings of Jesus, and that these quotations and allusions were related to ethical rather than theological matters. At the Kostenberger, Cradle, and the Cross, I presided that earlier, page 369. Boltman next turned around this admission as a point in favor of Paul, because Paul supposedly deliberately ignored Jesus' teachings while, quote, in the flesh. Boltman says Paul gives us a pattern that we should imitate rather than be revulsed by, as William Reed had portrayed its consequence. And so William Reed seemed to be implying, at least that's how most uh, Germans accepted it and created this back to Jesus movement in that in the 1929 period. And what's a tragedy is Boltman, this is the year when the Nazis are going to rise by 1933 and and they're going to turn to a very pagan uh, Wotan uh, theology, uh, corrupt people, and they are going to lead Nazi Germany into co committing the group, that community in committing one of the most atrocious crimes and of all time against a, an ethnic group. There aren't other many atrocious crimes, but this would have been one of them. And so we have a problem with this William Reed. He was one on providing evidence that Paul's epistles don't have any quotes of Jesus. And so why, why you know, the people said, why are we even listening to this guy? They just immediately, I don't believe most Christians know that, that Paul never quotes Jesus, that, that Jesus talking to him in the third heaven. He quotes the uh, the, the the communion exchange of, of words of Jesus at the communion. That's it. And and uh, some people claim when he says works worthy of their wage, uh, that he's quoting Jesus. That's actually the description of a passage in in the law, not in not a quote of Jesus. Jesus just simply saying the same thing that's in a law. So Paul doesn't even quote Jesus saying that. Okay, just so you know. But he doesn't. He never has any unique quotes of Jesus. And this shocked people in Germany, and they said, "Let's get back to Jesus." And the boatman says, "No, you don't." Paul says you don't do that. You don't. We once knew Paul, Jesus in the flesh. We know him that way no longer. We no longer follow and listen to the Jesus who came to earth, according to Paul. And I want to provide another quote from Mr. Boltman that will be shocking, but it's nonetheless true. This is in uh, Pastor Anthony Buzzard's uh, article in July 2016 entitled, the amazing shift away from Jesus in the popular gospel. And he says this is Rudolf Boltman remarks. What can be said about the historical Jesus belongs to the realm of the Christ according to the flesh? In 2 Corinthians 5.16, I just showed you. That Christ, however, does not concern us. What went on within Jesus' heart, I do not know, and I do not want to know. I do not want to know what went on in Jesus' heart. Do you see how, de do you know where the Nazi spirit came in from, from my friends? It's right here. So anybody who says dispensationalism or covenant theology, oh, it's just a, a different point of view. Look what it did. It poisoned the German people to disregard the commandments of Jesus, and they turned away from Christ's true message. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer fought a, a, a valiant fight to get us back to a costly grace, meaning the doctrine of repentance, 
turning back to Christ. That was his whole book, Cost of Discipleship. A lot of people don't pay attention. What he's saying there is the opposite of a faith alone gospel. And he's definitely bringing you back away from Boltman's point of view. Now, here's the source site on that. Rudolf Boltman, I can't speak German very well. I'll just try to do it phonetically. Zur Frage der Christologie in Glauben und Verschestehen by G. R. Beasley Murray in the King quote in the Kingdom of God and Christology in the Gospels in a book entitled Jesus of Nazareth, Lord and Christ, editor J. B. Green and Turner, Grand Rapids Minute or Grand Rapids Erzman, nineteen ninety four. And you'll see this article where this is printed up is this article here uh, of that is associated with Anthony Buzzard's uh, website. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to the standard introduction of, to our mission purposes. And you want to read more about Boltman, you'll have to go to the link here on the page, Boltman on Paul, and you'll read the whole article. It's uh, very educational. I hope that you'll see something you maybe are not familiar with about what's where current dispensationalism got its impetus or stronger impetus than it already had. We just have a paragraph and a half more to go. Based upon this, Boltman has influenced evangelical seminaries ever since to teach young pastors to emphasize the message of Paul, dismissing as largely irrelevant the words of Jesus. To dismiss Jesus' words are pertinent only to a supposedly old covenant of law, disregards entirely the prophecies that the New Testament was supposed to place the law more approximately on our hearts. That's Jeremiah 31, 31. It, it says the new covenant is to place the Torah, my Torah, on your hearts. A new place. So the new covenant didn't mean it was getting rid of the Torah. It was actually just changing the place where the Torah was. Instead of tablets of stone, if you put on your tablets of your heart, but not be done away with. A law of eternal for all generations be done away with? I don't think so. Okay, so there's another PS, but we don't have time for that. I'm trying to keep everything near 30 minutes. So God bless everybody. I hope that helps you to understand our mission purposes is to bring people back to Christ and cause them to repent uh, from that uh, apostasy. Frankly, we're talking about apostasy where you are, you are listening to a voice that teaches contrary to Jesus, teaches contrary to Yahweh, and is giving you a different Christ, and so much so that Mr. Boltman had to say, no, you have to believe that uh, Paul's comment in 2 Corinthians 5 or 16 is to be followed. That is, we no longer know the Jesus of the flesh. We only know the Jesus of Paul in his ascended state, and that's why Paul disregarded the 12. That's why it's that's why he was justified, because it's he's a new gospel, and it's totally different from the gospel of Jesus. So that is apostasy, my friends. And the, and the reason it's apostasy, just one last thing, is because Jesus is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, and that prophecy was every word that prophet speaks is from Yahweh. Per, okay, totally different language when Moses speaks. This is every word. And Jesus explained why the Father dwells in me, and the Logos you hear is not mine, it's the Father's who sent me. That means every word you're hearing from Jesus, unless it's an obviously personal remark that, you know, I have to go over here, I got to eat some lunch or something, is that means Jesus is giving you teachings, and it's really from the Father. And that means if you're disobeying Jesus, you're cut off from God's people. And hey, guess what? If you read Acts 3 21 to 23, that's exactly how. Uh, Peter emphasizes that part in the original Deuteronomic passage about I'll hold all, all people to account for what he says. Basically, I'm going to punish people for whatever who don't follow him. And he takes it uh, to mean that anyone who does not obey that prophet will be destroyed from God's people. You will be cut off forever from God, from God's kingdom. So you don't want that to happen. So, so that's, I'm hoping you'll Realize you need to repent from this attitude and do it as soon as possible because this is an ingrained uh, subconscious thing that gets in your subconscious to listen to Paul. You need to you need to cut that off. You need to cut off anything that would conflict with Jesus. And I pray that you will do that as soon as you can. Say a prayer. And uh, God bless everybody. Take care. Ciao. Bye.